Okay, great. Uh, so, so why am I here? Um, I'm a scientist at the uh, Small Molecule Screening Facility. We're part of the Drug Development Corps. It's a shared resource on campus. And our goal is to promote early stage drug discovery efforts on campus. And basically that means helping investigators find active molecules, molecules that, act, that are active on some biological process, somehow modulate a process that they're interested in. Often these are disease mechanisms that you want to interfere with. And if we find active molecules, these can be developed as probes to study the mechanism, or they could be developed as leads for a therapeutic or a drug. Early stage drug discovery is really difficult. It's like a needle in the haystack problem or an op a very difficult optimization problem. And one of the issues is the drug-like chemical space is huge. There's like 10 to the 33 theoretically uh, feasible drug-like organic molecules. It could be as high as 10 to the 60. And so it's really difficult to search all of that space to find actives and there's, we're nowhere near that. The current approach we use at our facility is mostly HTS, which is high throughput chemical screening. And this is very expensive. This is basically testing lots and lots of molecules to see if you get an active or what we call a hit. So what is virtual screening? This is where we use a computer model of some type uh, to evaluate all the molecules that we have access to. This is a chemical library. And we try to prioritize some subset that we think have the highest potential for activity. VS models, um, structure-based models can try to predict the compound target interaction, like the physical interaction between three-dimensional objects. Or it could be more abstract where we basically try to relate a chemical structure to some or a representation of it to some assay readout or some experimental outcome. And the goal really is to enrich for actives, to find a subset that's highly enriched for actives. And the greater the enrichment, uh, the, the lower number of molecules you actually need to test. So if we can focus the screening on the molecules with best potential, we get a cost savings. So in terms of searching this chemical space, there's the traditional high throughput screening. And then what we like to do is a virtual screen followed by focused screening. And in HTS, you might like in our experience on campus, investigators might have a budget to screen 10,000, maybe up to 100,000. There's been some who have screened 100,000. And physically we have about half a million molecules in our freezer that we can test, but that's it. Now in virtual screening, you are not limited to what you have physically present. And so we can screen up to maybe a trillion molecules. And then we wanna find that subset of 100 or 1,000, 10,000 to order or pull out of our library to test. Now, HTS has the upside that it generates a lot of useful data. Like you get a lot of data from HTS. And the downside of virtual screening with the focus testing is that you're limited to just the data, the real data that you got for the 100 or 10,000 compounds that you tested in the focus screen. HTS is very expensive, whereas virtual screening with the focus testing is relatively cheap. High throughput screening is, um, most people don't appreciate how noisy this is. When you are testing robot with robotic liquid handlers, tens or hundreds of thousands of molecules, you do it with basically one test or maybe two. And the outcome is pretty noisy. Uh, there's a lot of high uh, false positives and, and uh, false negatives. But virtual screening is uh, very noisy and potentially unreliable. So. That's what we're looking at here is how reliable is this uh, using a virtual screening method. One thing we know about HTS right now is that it does not scale to ultra large libraries. And I'll talk about those next, but there are libraries now that are, are approaching like hundreds of billions and there's no way that we're gonna be able to scale those in, 
it won't scale and they don't actually exist. Most of those molecules are just uh, potentially accessible, but not, not yet made. And so, but the virtual screening does, we think will scale to virtual libraries. So that's uh, pretty awesome. And in both cases, you need to have an assay developed to do anything. You have to have something in the experimental measurement. And VS models often require some data going in. So that's one of the downsides is you have to have certain types of data. So here I'm showing a, a bunch of different chemical libraries. Some are proprietary, some are commercial. And what you'll see is the various sizes in terms of the number of molecules. And these three here, these commercial libraries are physical libraries. These are in stock, meaning they have been created, they exist, you can purchase them. These other libraries, these much larger ones are virtual or make on demand. It means that the vendors believe with maybe 70 or 80% confidence that they can make the molecule in the catalog. And this is based on using available building blocks that they have and some well-established synthetic routes that they feel comfortable with. In our hands, we get about 80 to 70% of the compounds we try to order. Uh, but you'll see the space is begin beginning, it's getting huge. Like this was from two years ago. The enamine reel is about, I think it was a billion here. It's now in the tens of billions. So these are growing really, really fast. Now, one of the downsides we thought with these chemical libraries was that these ultra large libraries, since they're based on a few building blocks or a limited number of blocks and routes, that the chemical diversity in the space might not be great. And here we're looking at four different chemical libraries where the molecules are plotted as points in like a shape space. And over here, you'll see, this is a physical library. And here are the molecules that are rod-like in shape. Down here, they're disc-like. And up here, they're more spherical. And you'll see there's basically in this library, there's a lot of rod-shaped molecules, some disc and not many that are spherical. Now, this is the ultra large or uh, a virtual library. And what we see here is that the shapes space is actually pretty uh, well explored in some of these uh, undersampled regions in the uh, physical library. And so one thing we saw and other people have noticed this is that the diversity in these, these uh, virtual chemical libraries is actually really good. It's better than what we anticipated. So there's some value in screening it. So the first uh, sort of category of virtual screening model is the structure-based virtual screening model. And typically this is a, a process called docking. And in this process, we have a protein structure. That's the gray blob you see. And in that gray blob in docking, we attempt to fit a three-dimensional object, the, the small molecule into the binding site of the target structure. And so docking is where you basically search the different configurations placing the molecule in different orientations and evaluating. And the search is guided by a scoring function. It scores how well the uh, small molecule, the complementarity of the molecule in terms of its shape and electrostatic charges uh, with the target structure. And there's lots of different docking programs that we have access to. They have different search strategies and different scoring functions. And the docking score can be used sort of as a crude estimate of how well the molecule fits or its binding favorability. So we think we can use that in terms of how to rank order molecules when we want to prioritize in a virtual screen. So what does this look like? Well, typically we will run the um, docking and here you'll see the severe approximation is that we use a static receptor often uh, approximation and just fit the molecules in and score them. So here I have a list of uh, different molecules here listed vertically in this column and then the docking scores. And the ones that are highlighted blue are known to be active. So we're looking at a benchmarking target and the ones that are not highlighted are inactive and they have the um, corresponding scores. We sort the scores and what we hope to see is that the actives will actually move up to the top. And this means that the upper subset will be enriched for actives. And then in practice, we would only screen that upper subset. And in this case, you might have half actives, which would be amazing. Um, yeah, and so you wanna, see, you wanna see that the active distribution 
separates from the inactive compounds. So here we have like six different benchmarking targets. These are six different proteins with a set of known active compounds and a set of known inactives. And this is the score, score distribution for the molecules for the actives and inactives for these six different targets. And what you'll see is that the actives distribution of scores, this is using one program called Vena, are slightly shifted away from the inactives. And this suggests that docking is indeed a weak discriminator and often um, between actives and inact inactive chemicals. So DUDY is a, a, a set of benchmarking targets with known actives and inactives to test your docking program with. So in terms of docking compute expense, um, this depends on the complexity of the program. Some are more complex than others. The exhaustiveness of the search for the pose. And then, uh, yeah, there's a lot that goes into this. And to dock millions or billions of molecules, we cut corners. We essentially use the defaults usually uh, and choose some small box to search. Uh, and the docking time varies quite a bit between programs, but in general, it's about one, let's say, one minute per molecule per core thread. But you'll see here that these are two different programs where I'm showing the basically for like three and a half million molecules, what, how much time was required to dock it on one thread or one core on HTC. And here we have uh, another program and you see the distribution is much wider and longer. So this is doc six and these are the average time. So we're able to look at this we ended up actually getting rid of 84 in DOC in, in more current um, tests because it was just too slow. But we learned that from, from running these things. So we thought with all these resources, why not use all the programs? Because we don't know where, which one will work in a given case on a given target. So we use this process called consensus scoring where we dock the compound with multiple programs. In this case, I'm showing four different ones. And then we do something to the scores, quantile normalize or something so that they're all from the same scoring distribution, have e equal weights, and then combine them in some way. And one way to do that is just to take a mean of the scores. And this seems to work pretty well. It, it helps us separate actives from decoys better than individual programs. So yeah, here I'm showing a rock oc. This is essentially like a summary metric of virtual screening performance for 21 targets. And here I have a list of eight programs uh, on the left and the distribution of their performance across 21 targets. And then here is, I'm taking just the mean of the scores. And this does better than any individual program, significantly better. And then we did some fancier things where we use machine learning to sort of weight the different programs and stuff. But in general, we find that this is more robust also. You get fewer failures across targets when you use lots of programs. Uh, garnering wisdom from a council of fools, I've heard it described as before. So how do we scale? So each, each docking run, each molecule can be docked independently. So it's pleasantly parallelizable. Uh, typical codes don't benefit from special hardware GPUs. So I think we're good just using CHT CPU cores. Uh, and also to maximize throughput, we enable flock and glide to access more nodes, get onto OSG. We split the compound library up into chunks. And so we'll basically scale the chunk size so that it'll run in under two hours on a single thor, uh, core. And the chunk size can vary from five to 500 compounds depending on the program. Then we dock each chunk on a single node. And that way we'll request one node so we can scavenge any open nodes where if the CPU is very busy or a node is busy, as long as there's one open node, we can get on and start running. Uh, and we enable checkpointing and wrapper script. If we want to track in case we get evicted, we can restart and leave up and start up where we left off. How do, how do we benefit or how does structure-based virtual screening benefit from HTC? Well, really, we didn't know how well these docking programs performed until we could do exhaustive benchmarking and validation across lots of targets. Most of the time when you see a publication, it'll be like, oh, we've succeeded on this target and therefore you should trust the program. But really, it, you have to look across lots of situations to see 
where the programs work, where, where this can be applied and where it, where it fails. So we were able to look at lots of targets, lots of programs. Do we look at lots of parameters and search exhaustiveness in the docking? Um, and we're able to dock very large sets. Now we're up to like 40 million we're doing, although it's a long way out from a billion and the ultra large libraries, we have ways to get those libraries down to a manageable size to do docking on. And we might scale this up to a billion anyway. So it, it's almost like we have our own hypothetical 100 node cluster. Essentially, our, we're getting like three and a half million compounds docked per day. And I think it's, it's higher now, actually, since we started using OSG. But yeah, it's, it's amazing, this resource. And to, like, we have like one or two nodes at, for, at our facility that we can run on. So there's no way we could do this without uh, HTC. And now we're doing billions of these um, now. Uh, it was 100 million last time. Now we're, we've done billions of dockings on HTC. And so the, the other approach we're doing is ligand-based virtual screening. And in this procedure, we're ignoring the target structure. And all we're trying to do is relate a representation of each molecule to some biological readout. It, usually it's an assay or an experimental readout. And the small molecule needs to be represented in a vector of some kind to go into a machine learning algorithm or uh, classifier or regressor. And so we use what's called a chemical fingerprint. This is pretty standard in the field. And essentially what it represents, there's, there's a set of, or a, a vector that's about a thousand length vector, bit vector. And each of these index positions represents a certain substructure. So you might have like a carbonyl group so say this uh, index represented a carbonyl, you get a one. And uh, maybe there's a group with a sulfur in it or sulfoxide group. And that's not present in this molecule. So it receives a zero. And so each molecule can be represented in this bit string or like, uh, yeah. And so that goes into the machine learning classifier and you can train this. We have, uh, you'll need some training data. So that's one of the downsides with ligand-based screening is that you need assay data on real compounds and some active and inactive examples. Um, but yeah, this is, uh, we, we've, uh, we've tried all kinds of different models here, and we found that good old random forest with uh, the standard chemical fingerprint seems to work best on, we tried 128 different targets to validate, and in general, it performs pretty well once it's trained. So one of the questions was, can we scale this type of thing to these ultra-large make on demand or virtual chemical libraries that are soaring into the billions now. And so we, we tried our method. We had actually, we've been studying a protein-protein interaction called pri ssb that's essential for uh, DNA repair and uh, error correction in bacterial genomes. And so we've thought this is a good target for infectious disease or bacteria, antibacterial drugs if you can disrupt the pri ssb protein-protein uh, interaction. And Jim Keck's lab has done extensive screening. They've screened everything we have in our library. So they've tested 427,000 things, compounds, and they found 554 actives and a very low hit rate in there. So this is brute force HTS. It was very expensive. And one in a thousand compounds were active. So in our procedure, just to test this out retrospect, or actually this was prospective. We downloaded the real database, the, the, the enamine database, it's about a billion in SMILES format, the short ASCII descriptions of the molecular structures, split this into 18 batches of 60 million SMILES. And then on each compute node, single compute node, we would convert the SMILES into uh, fingerprints and then evaluate with our pre-trained classifier that was trained on the 430,000 compounds. We saw the average time per evaluation was only like three milliseconds. So, and this was kind of put together pretty quick. But this means we can scale to well beyond a billion, maybe hundreds of billions or trillions. And the mean runtime on 60 million compound batch was about 50 hours. But I think that batch size was excessive. It could be much smaller and we could run out a lot more cores, just 18 cores or threads, or I think there was single core per, per node. Uh, and, and so just a okay. quick heads up, we have like one or two minutes left. <laughs> we yeah. want to make sure we have time for questions. This is like the last slide. Perfect. So we, we 
ordered at the top 100 from the billion molecule screen. Only 68 were available, so a lot of those are not available. Uh, and then we tested each of these compounds. So that you see this on the left, there's 68 compounds. And we tested at eight different concentrations and red means it's active. And what we saw was about half of those molecules in the 68 were active. So now we're at a 50% hit rate rather than the brute force approach, which was 0.1. And this was on a billion molecule screen. So yeah, we've seen examples, like we've shown that ligand-based virtual screening scales uh, to a billion, and we can go beyond that. Structure-based scales beyond that, or like people have published uh, where they've done a billion now, but these, there's only two examples I saw in the literature and we're, we're going there next. And uh, right now we're at about 40 billion, but we're doing consensus approaches. And so there's ways to get the number down to get make it amenable to docking. Like you can get it down to 200 million if you do some filters up front on the ultra large library. So HT is fabulous resource. It allowed rapid cycles of de development, testing and validation. And we're scaling to ultra large libraries. And one thing we, we see is that we might benefit from using GPU nodes uh, especially if we're going to use uh, convolutional neur neural network scoring or more rigorous MD approaches for free energy calculations for a handful of the best molecules we might be able to evaluate with more rigorous methods. And uh, I'd just like to thank Lauren and Christine. They really helped us get this running. And Tony and Michael uh, were funded on R01 now with this work. And uh, I guess I have a little time for questions if there are any.